Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radio detectives. Well, before we do get started, I do want to remind you I've got a new book out. Uh, called uh, Powerhouse Hard Pressed. It's a it's a superhero comedy novel uh, with a little bit of an element of detective uh, comedy. The poke fun and play with uh, a couple of genres while telling a, a good story or with a great message. You can pick it up on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, uh, or again for the Kindle. Well, now we're going to get into today's episode of Mr. Moto Escape. This is Mr. Moto. Mr. I.A. Moto. NBC presents the world's greatest international secret agent, Mr. I.A. Moto, the popular Japanese character created by Pulitzer Prize winner John P. Marquand. Coupling his firm belief in the principles of freedom with his acute ability to perceive an enemy, Mr. Moto wages a ruthless war against all men who would secretly extinguish the light of liberty with the foul breath of tyranny. Tonight's story, a thrilling tale of Escape, starring Mr. Moto, Mr. I.A. Moto. <laughs> Assignment escape began in the seething politics of Italy. Vincenzo Di Pietro, leader of the Italian Christian Democrat Party and all his life a violent anti-communist, was making a speech in Rome. On the outskirts of the enormous crowd gathered in the Piazza Gregorio to hear him were two Americans, Frank Falvo, a New York reporter on vacation, and his wife, Julie. Quite unwittingly, they became a part of the thunderbolt unleashed that fateful Saturday in the Eternal City. Gosh, Julie, what a crowd. I tell you, Rome's the most exciting city in Europe. Oh, Frank, is that to Pietro now? Well, yeah. Now you would hear our real speech if you knew Italian. Your mother's going to teach me. Golly, they're crazy about it. Julie, this speech will set communism in Italy back ten years. Frank, look. What? That man over there. Where? He's got a gun. He's going to shoot. Assassination. The bullet ricocheted and echoed through every capital in the world. Just as statesmen everywhere recalled with terror the murder of the Archduke Francis Ferdinand in 1914, which exploded World War I, so it was with this. Two days later, an already alarmed Washington became electrified. An intelligence agent attached to our embassy in Rome wired the fantastic news that a New York newspaper man named Frank Falbo had not only disappeared, but had been accused of the Di Pietro assassination by the Italian pro-communist press. While Italian-American relations started, I flew to Rome. Eighteen hours later, I was in the Hotel Quirinale with Frank Falbo's wife, Julie. Mr. Moto, they've kidnapped Frank, and they've come right out and said he killed Di Pietro. 
Mr. Motor, what's going on? What does this thing mean? I am afraid, Mrs. Falvo, that it means a great deal. And these policemen, they knock at the door and force their way in and search the room. This morning they found the gun, the one that killed the Pietro. A gun? In Frank's suitcase. One of them must have put it there when I wasn't watching. Have you anything with which I could identify your husband? One snapshot. I just got it back this morning from the developing place. The police took everything else. Passports, everything. Uh, may I have uh, the snapshot? Oh, uh, that's it on the dresser. Oh, yes. It's not very good. He didn't know I was taking it, and he had his arm raised. Yes, I see. He was pointing at the top of the statue in St. Peter's Square. Mr. Murrow, I'm not used to this sort of thing. I can't stand it. Tell me exactly what happened last Saturday. It happened so quickly. After the shot, three men stepped out of nowhere. Yes? Two of them grabbed Frank and forced him into a car. The other one held his hand over my mouth until the car got away. The whole thing's completely insane. Why would they pick on Frank? Why did you come to Rome, Mrs. Falvo? Why does anybody come to Rome? We wanted to see it, and we wanted to visit Frank's mother. His mother? Frank was born in Rome. Oh. His father sent him to America to school when he was 18. Frank liked the States and stayed there. Took out his papers and got his citizenship. He hadn't seen his mother since. I see. Mrs. Falvo, are you religious? Well, I, I suppose so. As religious as anybody these days. Then I suggest you pray. God has often proved mankind's most powerful ally. Question, why? Why would an American sports writer be made the scapegoat in an assassination plot riddled with Italian politics? There seemed no reason. He, he was neither important nor influential. Why Frank Falvo? Where had it started? With whom had it begun? For the moment, there seemed no answer. Signora Falvo, I understand your son is coming to Rome next month. Ah, uh, si, Signor Battisti. You are the old friend, so you will forgive me if I, if I am like the bird with the excitement. Ah. My boy is of the big importance in America. Every day, for all the newspapers he writes, every day the pages and the pages. A syndicated column, isn't it? Scusate? In a lot of papers at once. Ah, uh, si, si. In all of them at once. All over. Even the president, he asks my boy the permission. And the money. But don't know me, the money. To his old mama, he, he has brought the honor and the rich. No, senora, your name did that long ago. See, si, see. Si. In 1826, Falvo married the emperor of Brazil. And by a cousin, we will relate to the Medici. But never a Falvo like my filio Francesco. And his wife, she is an angel of virtue, with the beauty of a Madonna. I am sure she is. And now, I'm sorry to rush, but uh, I have an appointment. Ah, I have been tiresome to you with my foolish boasting. But my boy makes his old mama to weep with the pride. It has been very interesting and most pleasant. Uh, will you excuse me? Oh, but of course. Marco! If you will forgive me, Signor Battisti, my feet, they are not so young. Marco will show you out. Of course. Don't apologize. And thank you for receiving me. Signora? Signor Battisti is leaving, Marco. Grazie, Signor, for coming. It was an honor. I have the party for my boy Frank. You will come, Signor, yes? Oh, I'd be delighted. Uh, goodbye. Thank you, Marco. Marco. Yes, senor. The Falvo boy will do perfect. Oh, I'm going to tell you he's a perfect. I'm going to tell you before. The old lady doesn't suspect you? Uh, she's uh, the old fool. She's a uh, no-nothing. Uh. Hmm. Related to the Medici's. Old Roman family. Ardent Christian Democrats. Boy is an American citizen and coming to Rome. It's perfect. Absolutely Perfect. whirling in my brain. It was a question which had no answer. Lieutenant Grant of our intelligence in Rome placed himself at my disposal. He informed me in my hotel room that he too was baffled. 
There's nothing new, Mr. Moto. The whole thing's a mess. It will get even messier, Lieutenant Grant, if Frank Valdo signs a confession. But why would they pick him? Ah, the same tired-out tactics. The same old propaganda down with capitalist America. Foment dissension excite the people. Prove that America is a country who sends gangsters abroad to murder and kill. Yes, I know. It's the same old stuff. Oh, incidentally, I got a note today. A note? Yes. Here it is. Ah, thank you. If you want more information about Falvo, meet me tonight, 314 Piazza Barberini at 10. Marco Giolitti. Who is he? He's the old lady's combination major domo, butler, and cook. The Signora Falvo? Yes, yes. She lives in a broken down house in the Via Latina. You will keep this appointment? Why not? Marco's harmless. While you are talking with this Marco, I shall call on Mama Falvo. Something must be made to happen quickly. And, Lieutenant Grant... Yes, Mr. Moto? I know you are tired, but when you go to 314 Piazza Barberini, see that your weariness does not replace your weariness. Marco, it's after ten. Where is he? Signor Battisti, the Lieutenant Grant will come, I know. If we don't get a confession from Falvo in two days... It will embarrass me. The Di Pietro murder is already off the front pages. This whole thing was my idea. I wish it to work. Ma, no, that is him. You stay here. And don't panic. I've done this sort of thing before. I'm uh, looking for a man named Marco Giolitti. Does he live here? No, he works here. Are you Lieutenant Grant? That's right. Uh, Marco's expecting you. Won't you come in? Thanks. Hey, this is quite a place. Uh, what's Marco doing? Holding down two jobs at once? Must have plenty of... A gun? What... What is this? Oh! Marco, come here quickly. Don't stand there gawking at him. You've seen dead men before. Take his body to the catacombs. And cut off Alvo's food while you're at it. Si, yes, senor. And tomorrow, we will deal with Mr. Moto. Uh, senor Falvo will tell him to leave town tonight. Maybe he's go. Because an old woman asks him to? No, Marco. There are better ways. But he's a dangerous man. So am I. The idea has been turning over in my mind all day. Moto has never seen Frank Falvo. There are no photographs of him in Rome. You may... oh, no, senor, it is impossible. Why not? I'll take Falvo's clothes. You'll be caught. His cuffs, his tie. I'm about the same size. I'll tell Mr. Moto that Lieutenant Grant is a prisoner in the catacombs. I'll suggest that we rescue him. You'll be there waiting for us. Signor Moto, you must leave Rome. Signora Falvo, someone ordered you to say that, didn't they? To say what? To tell me to leave Rome. No, Mr. Moto, no. They are making you helpful, aren't they? They are threatening you. <laughs> they are threatening to kill Frank unless you cooperate. Oh, I... Please, please, Signora Falvo, tell me the truth. Don't you understand what will happen if Frank confesses to this murder? I know nothing about a confession. My Frank is all I live for. Please, Mr. Mosto, you go now. Per favore, leave Rome. Uh, signora, where did that come from? Who, what? That mud. There, on the floor. I, I don't know from where comes that dirt. You leave Rome, Mr. Mosto, please. Signora, this little piece of mud has ended our conversation. I, I don't understand. And still moist, too. <laughs> Mr. Mosto, please, per favore, leave Rome tonight. If you run, they kill my boy. I... I can tell you no more than that. I, I cannot. You do not have to. This little piece of tufa granulare has told me everything. <laughs> oh, oh, Madonna me, have mercy. They will kill him. Oh, Madonna. Si, sí, senora. They will. Marco, tell me, where's my boy? What did he say about the dirt? Marco, I... How you get home so quick? How? You say you have appointment in the Piazza Barberini at 10. 
Now it's only 11. How are you get on so quick, huh? Medicis. Oh. Emperor of Brazil. Sure. With that face of a pig. You say one word and... <coughs> you are dead. You and your boy. Dead. <laughs> Mr. Moto, I don't understand. What is Mama Falvo hiding? How can a piece of mud be so significant? Mrs. Falvo, this piece of mud is tufa granulare. I'm... I am an amateur geologist, and I recognized it instantly. It is a rather rare type of clay found only at certain depths. What do you mean? Oh, come, come, Mrs. Falvo, surely you guessed. The catacombs, the catacombs of Rome. The catacombs? They were excavated centuries ago. When pagan Rome persecuted the followers of Christ. You think Frank... I think he is a prisoner somewhere in the catacombs. Mr. Moore. I found this in his mother's house. When I picked it up, it was still quite moist. Somewhere near her house, there is an entrance to the catacombs. But I thought all the entrances were guarded. All the known entrances. Mr. Moto, can't we call in the police? Can't we get 20 or 30 men and simply march no, in no. and... No, no, I have a better plan. Frank's mother will certainly tell whoever it is she is afraid of. That I was in her house. She will tell the men who are threatening her that I found the tufa granular. But... Unless I am very, very mistaken, they will realize I am on the verge of discovering where Frank is hidden. I believe that in the morning, they will get in touch with me. Mr. Motor, please, find Frank for me. I... I can't stand it anymore. Mrs. Fowler. I promise you that your husband will be safely back with you in 24 hours. There are many miles of catacombs beneath the Eternal City. I had in my possession one tiny bit of earth. Where did it fit? I prayed to my ancestors for guidance along the paths trod by the early Christian martyrs when they fought for their faith against the pagan might of the Caesars. In the morning, I tried Lieutenant Grant's hotel, but he did not answer. At noon, I telephoned the American embassy. He was not there either. I began to get apprehensive. And then, at three o'clock, a knock on my door. One moment, Lieutenant Grant. Oh, I... I... Mr. Moto, I'm Frank Falvo. Let me in quickly. Frank Falvo? Let me in. They're following me. I didn't think I'd make it. You are Mr. Falvo. I, I don't know what to say. I, I, I... They got Grant. They're holding him prisoner in the catacombs near my mother's house. Grant? Yes. They faked an appointment with him last night at 10 in the Piazza Barberini. Yes, that is true. If we hurry, we can rescue him. He's not guarded. No? They're out looking for me. It's more important to them that Grant is. I've got taxi waiting downstairs. Hurry, Mr. Moto. We haven't a moment to lose. <laughs> Mr. Falvo, have you seen your wife? Uh, I telephoned her. She doesn't mind waiting a little longer. We've got to get to Grant first. I tell you, it's a nightmare. There are rats down there, millions of them. You can hear them gnawing. It's wet and dank and horrible. Stop here, driver. Ah, I was sure of it. Close to your mother's house. Yes. An entrance to the catacomb through an abandoned well. They've been using my mother's house as a base of operations. It's all right. I've got the pair. Uh, here, driver. Uh, grazie, signore. Wait till he gets away. Now, this way. The Christians of ancient Rome are great planners. They had to be. Never knew they'd get thrown to the lions. They made secret entrances to the catacombs all over Rome. Ah, this is the well here. There are steps down. We should have a flashlight. There's a lantern at the bottom of the well. Climb over and be careful. Right behind you? There. The steps are wet. Be careful. Isn't it ironic, Mr. Falvo, that the persecuted of old should have left such hiding places for the persecutors of today? Yes, it is. Uh, there's water here at the bottom. Be careful. Here's the lantern. 
Have you a match? Yes. Here. Now what? Will you carry the lantern? My right arm, stiff. I, I was wounded in the war. Oh? Uh, hold it high. That's it. Now, there's a stone door fitted in the side of the well. Ah, here it is. There. Go ahead, Mr. Moto. All right? Yes. Now, I'll close this door. Someone might look over the top of the well and see it. There. Which way? This way. The left. Ah, the catacomb of Collister. Yes. It goes down many levels. So we only go to the first. Grant's in a cubicle along here. It has the odor of death. Yeah, two million corpses it should have. What? What was that? A cat. Oh, must have gotten in another way. Hurry, Mr. Moto. I, I, I want to get back to Julie as soon as I can. Is she a communist too? Moto, have you gone crazy? If you move so much as an eyebrow, I'll shoot you. The real Frank Falvo could have carried this lantern. I saw a photograph of him with his arm raised, pointing. Any time a pipe-sized little Jeff Parker. Oh. Marco, are you there? Yes, senor. Come here quickly. Oh, I've been waiting the whole day. I'm a think you're no come. This is Mr. Moto, oh. such as he is. Throw him in with Falvo and Grant. Ah, where, ah, where is this? Ah, what happened? You're a moto, aren't you? And you are the real Frank Falvo? Yes. What is that hideous noise? Rats. Thousands and thousands of them. I've kept the candle lighted so they'd stay away from his body. Whose body? He's right behind you. Ah, Lieutenant Grant. They brought him in last night. Pulled that coffin halfway out of its niche and... Stuffed him in it. There's no way out? None. You're sure? It's hopeless. Oh, I am afraid I have been very, very stupid. The whole world's stupid. We ignore these people. We do not ignore them. Putting them in jail for five years is ignoring them. They ought to be shush. Please, please, hysteria will not help. Well, it's easy for you to talk. I've been in here for God knows how long and I... Those rats. No way! No way! Please, Frank. Please, try to keep it. <laughs> now, please, please. I know you have suffered and I know our situation is difficult. I'm sorry. That's better. But it's so horrible. It's so fat. So filthy. Ah. So my little feline friend has been captured also. It slipped past me through you in here. Here, kitty. Kitty, Come here. Come, come. Let it work in the rats. There's enough of them around. Unfortunately, the cat is hungry. Hungry? What do you mean? That's why it's not interested in the rats. What are you talking about? Cats eat rats? No, no, Frank. They do not. Since when? It is a popular misconception. Cats will not eat either mice or rats. Oh, this is no place to argue about it, but you're wrong. I agree that it is no place to argue, but I am not wrong. A cat will kill a mouse or a rat purely for pleasure, and only if it is well-fed and energetic. Now look, Moto, every grocery store owner in America will tell you that a cat will... Kill mice, yes. Not eat them. A cat has to be half mad and completely wild to eat a mouse or a rat. Now, let us think quietly. Blow out the candle. We may need it later. Frank, how long have I been here? Oh, three or four hours. I can't keep track of the time. All I can think of is those racks. Get away! I got it. Mr. Moore, I can't stand much more of this. I, I can't. Frank, Frank, please. Please, try to hang on to yourself. Light the candle, quickly. How you should save it. Light it, I said. Since when are you in charge? Will you do as I tell you? All right. I knew it. Look. What? Here, kitty. Kitty, kitty, kitty. Kitty, kitty. Why, it's killed a rat. Yes, yes, here. Here, kitty. Kitty. Ah, ah nice, nice, kitty. Yes, Frank, yes. Somehow this cat has gotten out, been fed, and come back. 
It wouldn't chase the rats before. Now it has killed one. Somehow it has been fed. There is an exit somewhere. Wait. That sarcophagus with poor Grant's body. Was it out of its chamber before? No. No, it wasn't. They pulled the marble marker off. Yes. Dragged the coffin out and stuffed Grant's body in this afternoon. Hold the candle in the hollow. Over Grant's body. Okay. Further in. How's that? A little more. That's it. Uh, yes. Yes, there is a small hole. These burial chambers were built to hold as many as three or four sarcophagi. About nine feet beyond the end of this one is an exit. Where would it lead? Grab one end of the sarcophagus. Okay, sure. Now, pull. Pull. Uh, pull. Uh, Why is it tight? Yes, yes. Mr. Moto, listen. Someone's coming. Frank, don't give in. Don't sign that confession. Don't worry. Well, my two favorite prisoners. Batiste will get you for this. America's about fed up with the way Europe's been treating her nationals. Mr. Favo, we are getting tired. I wish a signed confession from Mr. Favo by tomorrow morning. I'm telling you I won't. I won't sign. Then, Mr. Favo, in the morning we shall be forced to remove your clothes and coat you liberally with honey. You will both be chained to the wall, and there will be plenty of light so Mr. Moto may watch. And remember, Mr. Favo, that rats are very fond of honey. Moto, they'll do it. The sarcophagus, quickly. They will. They're monsters. You pull, I'll push. Oh. Now. <laughs> it's moving. Yes, yes. A little more. It's coming. Frank, Frank, watch out. The whole thing's crumbling. Watch out. <laughs> Are you all right? Yes. Come on. Frank, wait. Wait, the cat. Moto, for Pete's sake, that noise will have him down here in 30 seconds. Here, Kitty, Kitty, Kitty. Leave it. It's only Kitty, a cat. It saved our lives. Moto, come on. It's hurt, it's hurt. Here, Kitty, Kitty, Kitty. Moto, you're crazy. They'll get us. Frank, it is one of God's creatures and it saved our lives. Come, come, come on, Kitty. Come on. Good, good, good. All right, Frank. We've broken through to one of the galleries. Now, which, which way? Which way should we go? There. To the left. Daylight. That is how the cat got in. Huh? Listen. They're coming back. Keep perfectly still. Don't move. Press yourself against the wall. Let's make a dash for it. Keep still. Blow out that candle. <laughs> please, please, my little friend. You have saved us once. You can save us again by keeping quiet. Marco, you are a fool. There are always rocks collapsing in the catacombs. <laughs> what is that? What is what? I'm going to hear something. Well, unless one is telling me, sure they're still there. I've never heard anybody so much fun about Bill Ross taking it. Now, Frank, quickly, towards the daylight. We're going to make Yes, and we're going to convict Marco and Batista of murder. We're out. Yes, yes, Frank. We're out in God's sunshine. No. There's my mother's house. We've come up on the opposite side. We have made it into the light. Yes. <laughs> yes, all three of us. You have just heard Mr. I.A. Moto, the world's greatest international secret agent in a story of escape. James Monks starred as Mr. Moto. The script was written by Jim Hain, directed by Harry W. Junkin, and produced by Carol Irwin. The cast included Joyce Gordon, Adelaide Klein, Joe Helgeson, Ralph Camargo, Merrill E. Joels, and Brad Barker. The music was transcribed. This is Fred Collins speaking, and here with a preview of next week's story is Mr. I.A. Moto. Thank you.
Next week, the story of a sacred band of gold. A story of mystery and intrigue concerning a Burmese religious relic known as the Wheel of Life. And now, may the tender arms of sleep enfold you as gently as the moonlight creeps from flower to sleeping flower. And may the new dawn, blessed with God's good light, renew and prove your faith that right and right alone is might. It's the Silver Jubilee on NBC. Tomorrow morning, start the day off right by hearing the best in radio entertainment over NBC. First, there's Tommy Bartlett and his interviews on Welcome Travelers. Then, fun and prizes with Walter O'Keefe and Double or Nothing. Next, Bud Collier is on hand to ask you to break the bank. And later, Jack Birch brings you songs and human interest stories. Now, Phil Baker invites you to join the $64 question next on NBC. Welcome back. This episode just leaves a number of things to comment on. Um, I'm, you know, with as many, uh, listeners as we have in the audience, um, I think Mr. what Mr. Moto said about cats, uh, not actually eating mice or rats, I think that, uh, it was, uh, generally true. I don't know if it's universally true. Uh, when uh, my family had a cat growing up, uh, mice were never eaten. They were basically uh, presented to us as loving gifts. If cat owners have a different experience, love to hear from you. Though perhaps not with too many details. I, I have to admit, this episode did a great job of that whole theater of the mind thing. You know, uh, with the sound effects, they made the scene in the catacombs just sound and feel so creepy. You know, my skin was kind of crawling, you know. Uh, a sort of uncomfortable thing with the theater of the mind, but uh, well done. Uh, I also had to appreciate uh, Moto's... Um, uh, Moto's uh, eccentricity with the cat, because he went to this point, we have to get the cat out of there. Um, when the thing is that the cat obviously knew the way in, knew the way out, and it wasn't like the criminals were going to stop to torture the cat. Uh, that, and, uh, uh, and that honey thread, that was, that was also kind of, ooh, uh, a frightening idea. <laughs> Um, but, uh, interesting episode overall. I also noticed, uh, it, it's a somewhat, uh, odd feature of the show that, you know, Mr. Moto, after each show, basically offers the listeners a blessing. And the ones we've heard so far have basically all wished, uh, a good night's sleep. I double checked the Mr. Moto log, and the program aired at 7 30 at night. Uh, maybe a little bit before uh, most people's bedtimes, but I think people may have tended to go to bed a little bit earlier back in 1951. All right, well, that will actually lead us into listener comments and uh, feedback, and we received a comment from Dave at uh, uh, on uh, Twitter. Thanks, Adam, for all you do. Love the podcast. Well, thanks so much, and you can follow us on Twitter, at Radio Detectives and uh, become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash Radio Detectives. Also, if you've not already, I'd appreciate you rating the show on iTunes. The main uh, Great Detectives of Old Time Radio podcast listening is currently, as of this recording, at 191 ratings, only nine away from uh, 200. So uh, appreciate ratings. Reviews not are not uh, necessary, certainly appreciated, but it's not necessary to write a review just to rate the show. But we'll be back tomorrow with uh, the next part of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And then uh, join us next Tuesday for another episode of Mr. Moto. 
From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.